in this particular webinar, you guys are going to be amazed and inspired by some of the most talented digital compositing artists working today. We've got Kate Woodman, Becca, Becca, Be <laughs> Becca Bjorki. See, Becca, you messed up. You messed me up with that earworm. Be <laughs> Becca Bjorki, uh, Richard Turborg, and Renee Robin. They're going to take you behind the scenes of some of their favorite compositing tips and tricks and the work that went into making some of the tutorial videos that they have hosted on the Alchemist's Library. Uh, first up is Becca Bjorki. She is a uh, compositing artist and she she brings to life a world of magical stories and projects through meticulous concept design cover art and portraiture next up is going to be kate woodman she's a structural engineer by training and kate developed her love of photography in 2011 while investigating earthquake damage in new zealand so what began as a compulsion to document the environment expanded into a fascination for narrative storytelling with a conceptual twist. And next up is going to be Richard Torborg. Richard is a people photographer in every sense of the word. He loves creating interesting images around people and stories he meets and photographs. And finally, the ringleader is Renee Robin. She's an expert retoucher. Renee applies focused commitment to post-processing, leveraging her master of color theory, editing, light, and shadow in the digital realm of Photoshop. And while we were going through that, I was supposed to be showing these photos of all these people. <laughs> I did not. So here is Becca. Here's Kate. Here's Richard, obviously. And there's the Robin right there. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna dive into this. I'm excited to chat with you guys. So welcome to the webinar. Um, let's get started. Renee, I wanna, I wanna start with you since you're sort of the, the architect of all this and the ringleader. So give us the background. What, what is the Alchemist's library? Why'd you put it together? Why are all these people supporting you in this effort? What's the deal? Oh, I don't know why they're supporting me, but I'm glad that they do. <laughs> they <laughs> certainly don't have to. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the Alchemist Library started, uh, well, first of all, it's COVID and everything sucks. And I was like, well, how do I make things not suck? And then I've been wanting to do my own tutorials and videos for a long time. But whenever I'm working with a company, there's always like directors and a bunch of other people involved and they do a great job and I love working with them but I was like what would happen if I was left to my own devices what would it be and so I was like well you know Halloween's coming up like spooky season which is like one of my favorite seasons and I was like well what if I just like reached out to a bunch of amazing artists and I was like hey if you wanted to make a tutorial about whatever the hell you wanted you know, would you be interested? Would that be something that you would be open to doing? And then, you know, we'll just like see what happens. Because like, I don't know, three people might be interested. <laughs> I was like, it's gonna be an exercise of futility. I have no idea um, if this is gonna work out. <laughs> but uh, it kind of did. And so we're working on like season two now because season one is wrapping up right away. But I mostly wanted to bring it in on like, I didn't want all the videos to be evergreen because the tech, like the technology changes so fast. I mean, between like Adobe updates and Capture One updates and even just camera updates, these tutorials, you know, all tutorials get out of date so quickly. So I was like, well, what if we just run them seasonally? So we'll just keep them live for like 30 days. And then if whoever buys them, they own them forever. But then it's on to the next season, you know? So like season one is done. You can't buy that one anymore. We'll go to the next one. And that's yeah. the experiment. <laughs> That's cool. It seems to be working because, you know, I was going through a couple of the tutorials earlier today, Becca and Curtis's, and they're, I love the flow. It's kind of the flow of your, you're looking over the shoulder of someone who knows what they're doing. Right. So and it's not the, the interesting thing. And this is the, your the, the whole series address is one of my pet peeves with tutorials and that they seem to be like a lot of the tutorials out there are very demonstrations of technology versus demonstrations of art. So it's like, you know what, let me show you how this new tool that that Adobe released. Let me find some random images to show you how it works versus that, you know, we're like the, the tutorials I was watching was like, OK, here's how you actually execute a piece of art and i'm going to use the tools that make sense in this context to do it so that was that was really cool and i also like the seasonality of it i think that's that's really really well thought out to kind of flow with that 
okay, it's Halloween season. Now it's going to be Christmas and New Year season. Then it's going to be Valentine season. And yeah, and yeah. release a group of tutorials that relate to that. What's, what's yeah, the next uh, season? The next season is winter season. So um, we're just finishing winter. up. Um, yeah, because we, originally we were like, oh, let's do holidays. And I was like, meh. Yeah, <laughs> the idea of like trying to make my artwork Christmassy, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I want to see uh, that. If it's winter, it's super open ended, right? So then I can go to like Richard or Becca or Kate and be like, what does winter mean to you? And if you could teach something art related around winter, what would you do, right? And I find that that, that makes the tutorials way more interesting than like you're saying, like just a demonstration of technology, you know, like I, I didn't pick artists that have like, you know, like 500,000 people on their mailing list. I picked artists who I love their work and I respect who they are. And fortunately they were like, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's dive in. We've, we've only got an hour to go through this stuff. So I want to be respectful of everyone's time, all of you guys, as well as people that are mm -hmm. watching. Becca, I want to start with you. Uh, before we dive in and do a screen share and have you kind of show some of your work, give us a little, uh, you know, what's your, what's your elevator pitch at cocktail parties that you tell people when they say, hey, Becca, what do you do? What do you tell them? Okay, we're talking to me. Sorry, there's a, yeah. a three-year-old. <laughs> what do I do? Uh, I thought you gave him sugar while they said. <laughs> yeah, it's not working. Um, okay, so what do I do? Um, well, I mean, a lot of the work that I've been recently doing has been more within the realm of concept art. Um, so I've been developing a lot of visual ideas for people who aren't visual artists themselves, and so taking ideas when making a story out of them, making it into something that's tangible and unique, that isn't just regurgitating the same kind of imagery and making it make sense also in like cultural ways and visual ways um, for my clients. And then for my own personal stuff, I've also been kind of reaching further and further away from photography and exploring more digital art. And so that's kind of the direction I've been going the last year. And I'm still hesitant to say like, oh, I'm an illustrator or anything, um, but that's definitely a very large part of what I do also. I love it. You're, you're a digital storyteller. That's it. Don't, I feel like everyone it. says that, but I mean, yeah, that well, is kind of... You know, digital yeah, storyteller, yeah. pixel pusher, you could be a pixel pusher. There you go. That's what Twitter <laughs> says. So I'll stick oh. with that. Yeah. There you go. Well, let's let's dive in. You 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 know, you have some things. I know you have some things to share with us. You want to go ahead and screen share and uh, give us yeah. a quick answer? Yeah, let's do that. So, um, all right. So I wanted to, I guess, talk about today um, about adding in some texture as a storytelling element into photos when it comes to character building, because that is uh, what I go over in the tutorial um, for the Alchemist Library. Sorry. Work from okay. home is fun. Hey, um, this, is, this is real life, people. <laughs> this is real life. There's no swanky office. There's there's just this. Um, and so I, I do get into some of these techniques uh, in the tutorial as well. So I wanted to really talk about using layer styles as a way to create more texture and create more storytelling elements in a portrait. Um, I think it's really easy. So if we zoom out here. Um, everyone loves girls with swords. That's something that everybody always gets really excited about. Um, but I feel like this particular image, you know, it very much looks like a model holding a sword. There isn't a whole lot of other character going on in our model here. And, you know, she doesn't look like she's been through battle. And, you know, she looks like maybe she picked a sword up and is standing in front of her house. So to give her a little more context, that's something I wanted to do. So. Oh, all right, <laughs> let's uh, dive right into that. Um, so first we're gonna just make a new blank layer. And the tool I wanna talk about the most here is gonna be using bevel and emboss in your layer styles. And so just to illustrate this real quick, we're just gonna draw a quick line here and double click on our layer. My Photoshop is not liking Zoom. Um, yeah, Zoom lags a little bit when you're, I'm when you're seeing doing that. Process. All right. There we go. OK, so when you double click your layer, it's going to bring up your layer style options. And the first thing I'm going to want to do here when building any sort of kind of three dimensional texture this way is going to be to take down the fill opacity completely. 
And so it's a little bit different than taking just the opacity itself down, uh, which would hide everything on the layer. This is only going to hide the pixels that are drawn onto the layer, but it's going to keep any effects that you add. And then we're going to come over and go to bevel and emboss. And right now, it's not super visible. But if we bring up our depth, kind of change our settings of, oh, maybe it's not going to work with Zoom at all. <sighs> there we go. OK. So now we can kind of see that building of dimension there. Um, and we can change the depth here. We can change the size of the bevel. And this is going to change a lot depending on what you're doing. So this is just kind of to show how this is going to work in a general sense. Um, so we can leave those settings as they are, but I'm just going to clear those uh, that drawing that I did. And now we're going to go into some textured brushes. So I have like 800,000 brushes. Uh, the ones I want to use right now, I'm just going to use Kyle's concept brushes. These are free from Adobe. You don't have to do anything crazy. I think there's even a link up here somewhere where if you go get more brushes, it'll bring you right there. And this is a whole, whole bunch of different kinds of textures. And what I want to play with first, let's see, this mystical smoke building brush. And I think it's really important to try to think about using textures in unique ways, where even though this says it's a smoke kind of texture, and if we were to draw just regularly, it would look a lot like smoke, it's also going to create a lot of interesting ridges and stuff um, when we're using it as a texture brush instead of just as an opaque brush. So if we start bringing this in here, we can kind of start building a little bit of shape. And we can lower the flow a little bit. So I'm just kind of start doing sort of a generic scar, like someone bashed her face in once upon a time. And it's pretty subtle. Wow. OK. Let me go back and forth a little bit. I don't know if I like that, how that looks exactly. But just as a sort of just generic base right now. And then if we double click and go back to our bevel settings, we can change how that looks. We can change the impact there. We can change how dark the shadows are going to be. We can also change the direction of the light. And you really want to think about where the light is in your image if you're going to be doing something like this, because it's going to look very different depending where that light is. And it's also going to look more realistic if your light angle is matching what is in the photograph. We can also then change the angle of the bevel if it's impressing down or if it's pushing up. Um, if you're thinking in scars, they pucker and do all these weird things to the skin. So some of them go in, some of them go up. Uh, it really kind of depends. But I don't know if I like exactly how that is. So let's try a different brush. So again, just clearing that layer and starting over. So the other one I wanted to try here for this particular effect, um, where is it? It's this texture carve brush. And you can kind of see the shape of the brush there. It's just this crunchy looking, dirty kind of texture. Let's go in. Oh, yeah. So that's our shadows are looking pretty crazy right here. But these little tiny hard edges on the brush are going to create really great detail. So if we go back to our settings, we can kind of play with that. So if we bring the size of the bevel down, then we're going to get that really fine texture here. And we can push that in too. So just different ways to build this up. You can even use this for like bringing back some, you know, pore texture, or skin texture there also. Now, if we wanted to do something uh, maybe a little more raw looking, if we're following this like warrior goddess sort of vibe, um, maybe she just got wounded or had something more recent. And we can bring some color back into this. So I'm going to pick like a kind of dark red sort of bloody color here. 
I'm going to switch my brush again to one. Let's see. All right, this one's called Mordor. That sounds pretty evil and nasty. <laughs> and I'm going to kind of just bring this along her face. Now, all these brushes, uh, these concept brushes, do have custom brush settings already, so they scatter and such there. Um, so some of them are more heavy, some of them are more light. It's going to really depend how you're painting. All right, so coming back to those layer style settings again, going to come up to our general blending options and bring that fill back a little bit more. So it's bringing in a little bit of that color from the brush. And that's maybe a little much, but I think, yeah. So now it's feeling more, more raw, more like a scab, maybe more like a burn, kind of Deadpool sort of look. Try this again with that fill turned on. Change the size of the brush. We can make this deeper. Gross. Cool. All right. It's awesome. Gross, cool. I like that. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it is gross. And I think it's really easy, especially as photographers, we get into this like everything has to be perfectly retouched. Or if we're thinking fantasy, we're thinking like beautiful princesses. And that's not always what every character is going to be. Like sometimes not being beautiful or perfect is going to add more to your story and make your work more unique looking than something that is perfect and beautiful and you know even ethereal and you can kind of mix those genres however you need in a way that tells your story best so this is great becca this is this is so uncomfortably wonderful right because <laughs> normally normally we look at retouching of attractive people and we try to make them look flawless and the best that they can possibly look and i've you know this is taking me completely out of my comfort zone and showing hey don't go in that direction let's go in a different direction and this is what's possible in photoshop this is amazing thank you totally yeah and that's that's exactly what it is i mean if you think of like you know any movies you like and this is actually something that really bugs me about movies um or tv where you have these like perfectly beautiful hollywood stars and their hair looks great and they might have just run through the woods for four days but their makeup's great and their hair is great and they're totally clean and when you are in charge of your own creative vision and you have the power of using digital programs to create whatever you want you don't have to do that you don't and you don't have to be limited by not having like a special effects makeup artist or you know fancy wardrobe or whatever it is like you have total power to do whatever you want it just putting the time in to figure out how to do it and making it and doing it intentionally, like with a purpose to make your images tell more of a story. I can uh, see it now, Becca Bjorki, anti-beauty. Anti-beauty, I'm down with it, I'm down. Um, I'll add that also to my bio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I wanted to also then take this this same idea and um, get it a little bit into the monster making because I know that's also what everybody loves and what I get a lot of questions about. And that's what the tutorial in the Alchemist Library is about, is about monster making. So um, this is a clearly really beautiful image <laughs> halfway through the tutorial. So we'd already done some work here on like reshaping the face and adding in some teeth. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about bringing in animal aspects, again, using these same sort of layer styles uh, to create visual interest there. Um, honey, you got to go away. Sorry. All right. So in the tutorial, it ends up going in this more like bat vampire mammalian direction. Um, but we're going to try something a little bit different here. So we're going to try adding some scales and building some texture into that skin. So this is just a you know picture of an iguana from Pixabay. And a really easy way to bring in animal texture is going to be to just use a photograph directly. And so if we just grab a piece of this here and just copy, paste it onto our image, and then just Control T to get to your transform tools really quickly. We can kind of match that on there. Just gonna line this up. I'm gonna right click on the transform and go to warp and just kind of move things 
around a little bit to fit. Um, now, if you need to add a, like a control point in your work tool, you can just hold Alt if you're on Windows, and it'll add a little point wherever you need it. I did not know that. <laughs> huh? I did not know that. <laughs> I, I learned that recently, like a couple months ago, and I was like, yeah. Um, I didn't so know you could change me. a transform mid transform. You're exactly. in the middle of a transform and you changed it. <laughs> I had no idea you could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Again, all the power. I am the god of my weird, creepy anti beauty world right now, and I can do whatever <laughs> I want. Okay. Becca, what I want to know is where you found a picture of me first thing in the morning like this. You know, I mean, your house is not that far. So, <laughs> oops. And then sometimes it does stuff like this, and then it takes a while to get things where you want them. Okay, well, we'll just say that's probably pretty good. All right, and if we bring the opacity back up, we can make a layer mask on that and start kind of getting rid of our edges just with like a big soft brush. And when you're adding textures um, to a portrait like this or to any kind of image, um, I totally forgot what I was gonna say completely. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, so like if I'm doing a face with like multiple different kinds of animal parts, I want to do it in layers. I'm not going to just put an animal face directly over the whole face and then hope it works. Like it's not going to work that way. You really got to handle each piece of the face individually. So one, one layer for each eye, something for the cheek, something for the forehead, something for the chin. Like you got to piece it together like this weird, creepy Frankenstein puzzle. All right, so that's looking obviously not super realistic, but that is, you know, a super quick way to bring in these textures and keeping them opaque is also going to help keep some of that realism from the original animal. Uh, another way that you can kind of easily quick and dirty bring in texture if you're going to use a photograph, uh, just change your blending mode on your layer. So soft light is usually pretty good for this. And you can see it's blending a little bit more. We are getting a lot of color information out of that original lizard image. And if you don't want to do that, you can always convert the layer to black and white or just add a black and white mask and clip it to that layer. So now we're just getting the highlight and shadow detail without getting any of that color information. And then we can also amplify that detail by say adding a curves layer also clipping that here to that layer. And if you pull down the shadows, it's gonna emphasize the shadow there. So this works in a lot in a lot of situations, but it's not gonna work in every single situation. It doesn't have a whole lot of dimension. Like the texture's there, it's great for like, if you wanna, I don't know, add like a painted texture to a background, or if you wanna add like some wood grain to something. And it does work in instances of creature creation like this to a degree, but if we wanted to, use that sort of bevel 3D effect, we can do that really quickly and easily here too. So I'm gonna just turn these off, hide that layer mask, flip this back to normal mode, and I'm gonna hit Control J, just make a copy of this. I don't know why my keys are not working here. There we go. Okay. Now, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna make a custom brush out of this lizard texture. And it's pretty quick. Um, we're going to want to make sure we have a lot of the shadow. I'm actually gonna convert this to black and white first. So just going up to our image adjustments and just making this layer black and white. And I think maybe I'm gonna make another curves adjustment here just directly on the layer and kind of drag things down. So for a custom brush, you're really going to want a lot of that fine detail. You don't want a lot of blown out highlights or they're not going to show up with the brush at all. So just dragging this down. And you don't want to crunch your blacks too much either. Like right here, it might get a little weird looking, but all right, let's try that. And it's always kind of a little bit of trial and error depending on the image. So to make a brush out of this, what we're gonna do first, we're gonna select our darks. And actually I'm gonna get rid of this edge. Why are we not? That's weird. Sorry for my weird Photoshop problems. I think it's my computer's confused. All right. 
Oh, I see what my problem is. There we go. Okay, so just deleting that kind of weird dark edge. So we just have the scales here. All right, so go to select and we're just gonna select a color range. And actually I'm gonna hide the background image. So we just have that image that we wanna make the texture from. Now we're gonna go to color range and we're gonna select these something here in the shadows. And I wanna keep it kind of all the way up so we're getting every little piece of gray within there to create this brush. And we're gonna hit okay. Then you go over to edit, define brush preset. We'll call this lizard eye. And bam, now you have a custom brush. And Photoshop's just gonna dump this down here at the bottom of your brushes. Deselect and you can see now we have a brush that looks exactly like that image. So what we can do, I'm gonna just delete this, make a new layer and turn our background picture back on. I'm gonna take that brush in and drop it on there. And now we're gonna go in with the bevel again, just like we did with the scar idea. I'm gonna turn down that fill and turn on the bevel. And now we have this very detailed texture directly into the image below. Wow. So we can switch the direction again and just kind of play with this. Till it looks, you know, a way that we want it to look. That's crazy. <laughs> That's awesome. And if we want to double up those effects, we can turn that uh, that soft light layer back on, except I changed all my settings. Haha, <laughs> there we go. All right. And so now you can see how it's adding. It's not lined up perfectly, though, but there we go. It's adding this extra amount of dimension here. And so what, one last thing I wanted to mention here, too. Um, when you are making these brushes, uh, you can like feather the edge of your selection or whatever when you're making the brush itself. This one, I just had a hard edge. Um, so we can always go in with a mask and just kind of soften that up a little bit. And again, you'd really wanna do this slowly in layers over each part of the face and then use those warp and transform tools to make them fit the shape and curvature of the face. See, this is what people should do with their Tinder profiles. They should make themselves look distressed so that when they meet people in person, they look they're pleasantly surprised. Like, wow. Right? <laughs> What's the opposite of catfishing? Scars cleared up nicely. <laughs> All right, one last thing here, just real quick. Um, yeah, so, okay, so one other aspect of these layer controls that I wanted to touch on when adding texture, and this is something, again, that I've seen in a lot of composites. I know I've done this myself, where you lay on a texture in whatever method that you have, but you aren't necessarily considering where the light, again, in this image is working. So I think it's always really important to keep in mind where the light and the shadows are hitting whatever you're adding a texture to. So areas like this, within like the curve of the cheek or you know anywhere that's darker, like under here on the neck, if we added something down here, they're not gonna be catching the light and emphasizing that texture in the same way at all. So one way we can control that aside from just masking it off is gonna be using these blend if options down here. Uh, I really highly advise for anyone and everyone to get familiar with using blend if controls on your layers. If you don't do that already, they are great for color. They are great for texture. They are great for just about anything you could possibly ever want to do. Maybe not anything, but you know, they're, they're good. Do that. Um, so we can uh, have this control here. And what these little sliders do is they are going to hide your current layer and only apply it to areas of highlight and texture or highlight and shadow, depending on your controls here. So if we pull up the shadow limit, I guess, you're gonna see it's disappearing from the areas with shadow. If we pull down the highlight, it's disappearing from the brighter, more highlighted areas. Now, again, if we hold Alt, I'm sorry, I don't know what the Mac hotkey is here. We can separate this little slider 
in half. And that's going to give us a little more fine control on what our range of shadow is that we're going to hide the edge of the texture from. So we can bring this up a little bit. And you can see it's starting to hide this edge here. And you can bring the bottom slider up too and create a wider range within that. So there we go. We can start adding, I mean, I can do a little more painting here uh, if we want to like totally get weird with it. But I think that is pretty good for just kind of a start. And I go over this more in the tutorial, not necessarily with scales, but I talk a lot about fur, about building um, texture and shape beneath the skin, which is something you can do in the same way. Um, so in the tutorial, I kind of get into how we're going to be building like veins and creating bumps and ridges and changing the bone shape also within the face using this exact same idea. So there's so much you can do just with like this one simple tool that's really going to add a whole lot of dimension to your images and to your creature creations if that's something you want to start exploring. Love it. Love it. That's great. What a, what a, what a great sort of teaser into how to do this stuff. You know, just that one little, I mean, I, I imagine Becca that there are, you have a hundred or more or hundreds of little, little techniques like this that you use to create the, your, your creature effects. When you're, when you're creating, just to wrap this up, when you're creating one of these, these, uh, you know, <sighs> these artworks are you do you start do you begin with the end in mind i you know you're going in and you're photographing this this person knowing that you're going to create sort of a vampire rendition of them or do you take photos and then like kind of let let them guide you and like you know what this person would look good as a bat maybe i'll add some reptile skin you know <laughs> is, is it organic or is it planned uh generally i mean it's more planned. Um, a lot of the more recent creatures I've done aren't even people, they're, they're all 3D renders. And then I'm going in with photos and texturing a 3D wow. rendered humanoid person or creature then with photographs in a lot of these same ways. So using photo textures to make them feel more real. Um, that's something, I mean, obviously this is something you can do fully within 3D, but it's also very computer time and skill intensive. And mm -hmm. I, you know, when I know my end product is going to be a 2D image anyway, it's really just easier and a little more, I don't know, free flowing when to do it with photo textures in 2D instead of directly in 3D. Um, in cases where it is a photograph, uh, yeah, I would have an idea of how I want things styled from the get-go. I don't necessarily know exact expressions and stuff, but I have a good idea. And then once you're going through the photos and stuff, you kind of figure out which ones are gonna work best and which are not. Got it, cool. Well, thank you, that was fantastic. I think uh, people are excited. I know I'm excited, that's really cool. Just to, oh. to see that. Every time I see someone demonstrate Photoshop, I always realize how much I don't know about Photoshop. Because <laughs> there's all, there's all these little things Same. that are like, oh, I had no idea you could do that. It's just such a deep application. Totally, oh, cool. definitely. All right, well, Did thank I you. Off my screen? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead and stop sharing and we'll move on to Kate. Kate, you're up next. Shoot, I have to follow that. Yeah, you got to follow that. You, you got to outdo Becca. Come on. Let's Becca see what you was, got. was much more prepared than I am. Um, but uh, no, I mean, so to give you a little kind of background. Um, well, first, let me share my my final picture with you guys. Yeah. So you can look at something besides my mug. Um, I really like composite photography because I am cheap and lazy is what it really comes down to. Um, I, I think that I, I'm kind of a hermit. I like to like stay at home and not go out and with like a bunch of people on a big crew and a big set and like have to be really dependent on what the light's doing at a certain time of day. Um, it's just, I feel like composite gives you a lot of freedom to be really creative and you you're kind of allowed the time to do what you want to do and kind of build it up and create something that doesn't necessarily exist. Um, so the kind of fantasy element is, is what I really enjoy and just having as much control as possible um, and being able to kind of build stuff up is really fun, but also it's, it's a much more kind of cost effective way um, especially for beginners, right? Like no one comes into photography 
having a ton of gear and a ton of money to throw around for personal projects, right? So what do you do? What's the alternative? Um, and the, sh the short answer is you kind of make it work with what you have. And I've been doing that for eight years now. Um, and, you know, I so often I get people that look at my stuff and they're like, well, if I had you know, $20,000, I could do that too. And I'm like, dude, no, this I show this in my living room with like a $150 budget using lamps. Um, cool. And so I, I think that's like an important thing to, to be aware of as a photographer that you shouldn't limit your creativity or tie your creativity to equipment. Um, Becca just demonstrated a bunch of really cool Photoshop techniques and I'm kind of a dinosaur when it comes to gear and, and learning new techniques and stuff. Um, but, you know, I, there are just so many ways to be creative that don't involve super high production. Um, and I, and I want to kind of encourage other photographers to use that creativity and think outside the box and use the resources that they already have, however limited they might be, um, to kind of create some cool stuff. Um, so I, if you give me a second, I'm going to switch over to my, my phone and give you a little tour of the, uh, my living room because it's still actually kind of set up like this much to my husband's chagrin do it. he's like get this damn couch out of here <laughs> uh hold on one sec this has like a stranger things look about it yeah yeah so i am like super into oh, wait, wait. i muted myself here you go one I'm second one of you Okay, you're muted. You're muted on the phone. Okay, can you hear me now? I'm going to on I'm going to see if I can't get you going here. Do you have headphones, Kate? I don't. Turn down the phone volume. Yeah, turn the phone volume down. I think that's that's probably it. Well, it's already down. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm gonna. There we go. Okay, try it now. Okay, we muted her completely now. There we go. Okay. I don't know why I'm echoing again. Bear with us, folks. I'm trying to mute. Okay, you're muted. You should be fine because you're muted on your computer and unmuted on the phone. I know. I should be. So why don't you do this? Why don't we go ahead? Why don't you just drop out on the computer and continue on the phone and then rejoin on the computer when you're ready to come back to the computer? Right. So we only have one of you. There you go. Okay. Okay. So now we have you. I'm going to spotlight you. There you go. So you're on the phone. You're on stage. Oh, all right. That was an adventure. Technology. <laughs> right. Good. So anyway, quick walk through here. So um, this, this is this is the scene as it was shot, and as you can see, it looks very different um than when we uh we first well then the sh photo on the screen so first things first um i painted my fireplace this lovely avocado green color um just to make it more like mid-century wow you, you painted that for the for the shot you painted that yeah sometimes i just get bored and decide to paint walls and fireplaces this wall i painted uh last year actually for a christmas shoot that i did that's some dedication right there <laughs> it is but <laughs> it's a it's like a quick cheap easy way to make a huge impact right because what's a gallon of paint like 20 bucks um 
And so, you know, these are just kind of ways that I utilize to kind of keep things creative and different um, without breaking the bank. So um, in terms of like the setup, so I really wanted something that felt like somewhere between like 70s and 80s, mid-century, my house is mid-century. This fireplace is kind of like a focal point. Um, these paintings I got at Goodwill for like $2 each. Um, and then I threw this up here. This is something my grandmother painted. So I had it kind of laying around. And then my couch was a Facebook marketplace uh, find for like 50 bucks. It's pretty fantastic. Um, and this is kind of like the, the focal point. This is my dog. She wants to be in the show. <laughs> um, picked up these fantastic lampshades here for I think like maybe 10 bucks for the pair of them. Also at a Goodwill. Uh, and then side table here with a couple of like knickknacks, all of this stuff you can find like at thrift stores and it's super cheap. Um, and there's just, there's just like piles of furniture and stuff. You have to be creative in terms of like having a good pre-production plan and, and sort of understanding what the aesthetic is that you're going for. Um, because that'll help you kind of be much more efficient when you're shopping and knowing what kind of what you're looking for too. Um, I took my curtains down, but I did find a set of curtains that kind of fit into that eighties style. Um, and when I was doing the pre-production thing, I was thinking, um, stranger things meets like poltergeist or something. Um, mm -hmm. so something kind of of that era. I love that. Um, I love horror movies, especially in that kind of time frame. Um, so I really kind of wanted to pay homage to that. Um, and then really that's that's all that really was there in terms of the accessorizing and the styling. Um, and then it came to kind of what's the composition and then what's the lighting. Um, oh, I did have a TV that I got at a uh, thrift store that was like, 10 or 15 bucks too. Um, and that kind of serves as the focal point of the scene. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the quick tour. That's cool. And and see, was this, was this a self, was this a self sort of assigned project or was this for a client? Yeah. So this, this was self, self assigned. I actually, yeah. I actually bid on a job for Netflix for Stranger Things last year and they ended up not doing the project so this was kind of my attempt at like see what you're missing um <laughs> yeah so I don't know no it was it was it was a huge bummer that that fell through because it would have been really fun um but uh yeah I really I mean it's it's something that it's a show that I like. It's a concept that I like. And I, and I knew I wanted to kind of work in my house and my space again. Um, it's something I do all the time. I think like half of my portfolio is stuff that I've shot at home. Um, so yeah, that was kind of the, the gist of the concept. Um, then uh, let me switch back to the computer because I kind of want to walk you through the, the lighting here. Cool. So, Hold, now, when you were, yeah, go ahead, go ahead and switch back over. Yeah, because I'm, I'm curious about the, the lighting setup for that and how you sort of built the, the practical set in advance of kind of bringing everything into the computer to kind of work it to where you got it in Photoshop. Yeah. 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 There we go. <laughs> it adds to the, the Stranger it's Things dramatic. spooky vibe, right? <laughs> love it okay uh let's see let me actually go to my capture one first because i have kind of a breakdown of the the images as we kind awesome. of go through the scene um so the the way that i typically go through my process is the first thing is kind of establishing the frame um, so what do I want the composition to be? And that's a function of the narrative and the storytelling. So all of my imagery, imagery 
t is very narrative based. Um, whether it's a set of images or it's a single image, I want to tell some kind of story. Um, and in this particular uh, shoot, it was going to be kind of a, a single frame story. So I had sort of a, a hero shot in mind for it. Yeah. Um, and I knew kind of the, the elements of the scene that I wanted to include in the composition. So I knew I wanted the fireplace in there. I knew I wanted the sofa in there, these lamps as kind of framing elements. And then I was going to have uh, three models or characters within the scene sort of engaging with the, the TV. And I, I think about 90% of the idea and the concept is um, is created in the pre-production process, but then I do kind of allow myself a little bit of freedom as we're shooting and as we're kind of building um, to be a little bit more creative or ad lib that, um, because I do think that if you confine yourself a little bit too much in the pre-production end, you, you may miss out on some opportunities to really make something compelling. Um, so in any case, the this frame was kind of like, all right, it's got kind of all of the elements that I need in sort of the right configuration and leaving kind of the TV in the foreground as a focal point, but enough space in the background to kind of include the characters. Um, and then once the frame is established, I build my lighting up um, and the lighting is, I, I kind of do it as a sort of iterative process and kind of start with one light at a time. I shoot a lot of interiors, uh, a lot of bigger spaces sometimes, and I know that can be really intimidating to people um, to, to worry about not just lighting a person, but lighting a full space. Um, and it was really intimidating to me as well when I first started, even though it was something I knew I wanted to do, it was just kind of like, oh, how do I, how do I even begin? And the reality is you just begin with one light and you kind of build up from there. So um, I also use, I also like to use practical lights as much as possible. Um, and part of that is derived from my interest in cinematography. So when you light uh, like a movie set, you can't have light stands in the picture um, and you have to rely on light from light sources that are in frame or just out of frame to make it feel believable. And so with my photography, that's something that I try to kind of stay true to. So in this scene, we have a couple practical lights. We have our two kind of lamps that are flanking the couch here. So those are gonna be kind of the initial lights. Uh, I have a light, the starlight kind of above my front door. So there's another practical light. And then I have a fireplace. I knew I wanted that kind of like spooky fire, uh, orange light kind of element in there. So that's kind of the, the base of the lighting. Those are kind of the, uh, the lights that I kind of want to start with. So this is kind of, the beginning here. Um, and for this particular scene, I knew I wanted it to feel kind of nighttime as well. So we actually blocked out the windows. Um, we started shooting earlier in the day and it kind of transitioned into nighttime, but because it's spooky and kind of creepy, uh, I knew I wanted it to feel darker and feel more like nighttime. So we just threw some B flats in the window out there. Um, which you can see there's kind of a gap up here later. We elevated those and closed that gap, but, uh, you know, as a light test, you just kind of work into things. So, um, so two lamps, the light above in the kitchen, and then our fireplace were kind of the starting point. And then another light source that seemed kind of necessary was the fireplace, or um, sorry, the TV. So knowing that I wanted these characters kind of like looking into the TV, maybe something was coming out of the TV, um, you know, something, something needed to be kind of pushing out from the television to kind of give us that effect. Um, and I, I should say, um, before I get too far, the, the lighting that we used for the TV and for the fireplace you can see here, these are just kind of constant light tubes. Um, 
these I think are quasar light tubes, but you can find like kind of a cheap LED light strip on Amazon to use. Um, and these are nice because you can change the RGB values, but um, you could also just throw some gels over there. This is, we're using a roll of cellophane to get that kind of blue color on um, the light that Ken's holding here. So again, kind of cheaper ways to sort of light the scene and kind of create these sort of practical effects. Um, so the, the light here, we have kind of the blue that's emanating from the TV. We've pushed some smoke into it um, from a fog machine just to really kind of backlight that color and kind of get more of that sort of spooky effect. Um, and then this is just kind of building up in pieces. So here we're lighting the side of the TV because I want to make sure that we're getting some of that blue wrap around the side of it. Here we're getting kind of an angle from the front of the TV um, and just kind of taking a bunch of different frames. So I have some material that I know I can use kind of later. And this, this is kind of the process that uh, we used for the TV. You know, we didn't have the right, we, we didn't have a TV that could glow blue like this, or we didn't have a light that emitted enough power in the right configuration. So what do you do? You just, you, you MacGyver it. Um, you take your tube and you move it around and you put it in the right placement so that you can eventually kind of piece together what you need um, in, in the final composite. Ideally, like, yeah, you want to be able to do all of these in uh, in camera using the best lights and the best systems, but that's not going to be accessible to everyone at all times. So it's just creative problem, sol problem solving. So uh, the next kind of light source that I wanted to incorporate here was something that felt like it was coming from outside and you can actually see it in this frame here um, right by the door. I wanted this kind of raking light that looks like something's coming through the door, or something's outside the door and I don't, we don't know what it is, right? It's just, we've created this kind of air of mystery. Something's coming through the TV, something's coming from outside the door. Um, just really kind of incorporating all of those like stereotypical fantasy, science fiction, horror visual effects. Um, and just kind of reusing the tube that we had used for the TV to get that blue, blue glow, we just switched it to an orange gel and popped it outside. And what happens later is you just kind of build these all up together in Photoshop. Um, and then, you know, stuff, stuff kind of happens along the way where you, something catches your eye and something looks interesting. So I had a moment where my assistant was um, bringing that light tube back inside and he kind of held it up to the, um, the curtains and there was sort of this really nice raking light effect on the curtains that was adding a lot more texture and a lot more drama than, was, uh, than, than our previous light source or lighting setup. So I was like, oh wait, let me catch a frame of that too. So that's another element that maybe I can composite in later on. So putting this all together here, uh, let's see, I have a lot of ridiculous layers here, but I know there's a faster way to do this. I told you I'm a dinosaur when it comes to Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so this is kind of our base plate here. So this is what we're starting with. We have basically the practical lights and then we have the fireplace. And then here I've enlarged the um, painting that's above the fireplace just to give it a little bit more oomph. And then I want to kind of darken it to make it feel a little bit more ominous uh, and give it a little bit more drama. Here's where I'm kind of adding in the that glow effect from the curtain. And that's just from that light that's kind of breaking across everything there. 
And then here I've added the door glow. So this is uh, from the light that's kind of outside of the door. Now we've got our TV into the scene. So again, this is just, you know, you're locked down on a tripod. You're kind of building everything one by one. Now we're adding some more fog into the scene, darkening it down a little bit more. Sorry, my microphone's right in front of my screen here. Here is the side of that TV from that kind of raking blue light that we have there. I liked this kind of effect of uh, the ceiling from one particular frame where we had this kind of cool, cool scene up there. And here we didn't ha actually have the light kind of coming through the top of the door. And I thought, you know, if you did have this kind of like big orange light source that's on the outside of the door, it would probably be coming up kind of through the top as well. Um, so that was just kind of drawing in additional light on top to make it feel like a little bit more like it was wrapped around. Here I had um, a, just a stock photo where I comped in the fire in the fireplace. So just kind of replacing that um, light bar here, which doesn't actually look like a fireplace. I wanted to make it feel a little bit more authentic. So through some, some stock fire in there. Uh, the other thing here too, so these are the curtains that I did get and I got them off of Etsy for maybe 30 bucks each. Uh, but as you can see, this set here isn't quite long enough. Um, and so I wanted to extend that a little bit. So that was just a matter of kind of duplicating some of the texture and bringing it further down. And then just getting, just these kind of little details are the things that I feel like it's the stuff that you kind of do more of the more um, comfortable you get with composite photography. Um, you know, this just kind of raking light down here, is it necessary? Probably not. I just like the look of it and I thought it was kind of a, a cool additional feature to showcase some of the detail there. Probably added an extra unnecessary amount of time to my workload, but I'm a masochist. So there you go. And Kate, well, Kate, one of the, one of the things I think is, is a, a good point to hammer home for the folks that aren't necessarily initiated into the compositing world and are more in the still photography capture it all in one frame world is that you're, this is like time travel because you're, you're capturing components over a span of time that will then be composite into into a single frame to kind of yeah. purport itself as as a segment a, a slice of time but you as the artist can capture these pieces over hours if you want to and then combine them later right yeah definitely and that's also the nice part of using your own space is you have kind of the ability to to take your time and to tweak stuff and to kind of work and work your way into things too and i also think you know even if you're your intention isn't necessarily to do a composite, setting yourself up to have the ability to experiment and kind of um, play around with different light setups. And, um, you know, like for example, like the light breaking across the, the window, that wasn't something that I had initially anticipated or wasn't even sure if it was something I would include, but I captured that frame anyway just in case that is something that I did want to do. And I think composite photography kind of just allows you the ability to, to make those decisions, uh, those creative decisions in a way that you don't necessarily have to do it practically, or you haven't lost an opportunity if you don't do it practically. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's just a leap for I think a lot of people to 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 kind of jump over as they sort of start examining the power of Photoshop and the compositing side of things with layers and all the other things that you can do versus quote traditional photography of get it right on in one frame and light that one frame perfectly then press the button to get the shot and then it's over after that. It's really in your world, Kate, it's really just beginning after that. And then you execute yeah. and create the final work. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, in some cases, would it be possible to get all of this stuff done practically in camera? Possibly. Um, but 
you know, we have a situation where we have these characters that come in and lighting on these characters when you're, you know, when you light a scene that's stationary and it's an interior, you can have a long shutter speed, right? You can, you can drag the shutter for as long as you want. You can reduce your ISO. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're locked down on a tripod, but when you're talking about bringing in people in an, into an environment, sometimes if you're using all strobes, you're sacrificing the aesthetic of the environment because you just can't practically light things the same way in order to match kind of the lighting on, on the people. So yeah. there's going to have to be a compromise um, if you are trying to get it in a single frame. And the reality is too, it, you know, there are light stands on either side of these characters on set. They're going to have to be composited out anyway um, in most scenarios, right? Um, so you're going to need back plates that are clean and don't have the light stands in it and don't have the people in it so that you have the material to uh, fill in the gaps where the light stands would be. Um, and so that's kind of another really important, I, you know, I think people think of composite photography as sort of the approach that I've been showing you, but the reality is it, it can be a lot simpler than that. It can be, you know, if, if you do have to photo or if you have, do have to take a light stand out of it, what do you use to replace that? Um, and it's a lot easier just to use a plate from the existing environment versus, um, trying to recreate that or rebuild that in Photoshop using cloning or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't have to be sort of a grand uh, process, but knowing the concepts and knowing how to sort of employ that, I think allows you as an artist a lot more flexibility um, and a lot more room for creativity. Yeah. Yeah. And also... You know, in my rudimentary experience with doing the sort of, of thing, compositing, um, the available light or daylight is your enemy, right? <laughs> because because the light changes from second to second and shadows shift and all that stuff. And if you can't control that, then you're giving yourself a lot of work in the end, right, Kate? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I actually... It is totally true that if you are kind of dealing with ambient, you're dealing with um, shifting conditions, right? Yeah. Um, but I also think that that balance between ambient and strobe can be really beautiful. Um, and it's that's that's kind of another um, way to to really approach it is, yes, I'm using ambient for the environment. I'm using strobes for the models. It's kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah. No, this is great. This is really cool. Well, thank you. Thank you for doing this. And, yeah. and I hope I hope minds are blown in the audience of, of people that are watching this because, you know, the whole purpose of this webinar is to kind of give you interesting ways to look at Photoshop and compositing and doing different things with your with your work. I think we're we're hitting it out of the park. So thank you, Kate. I appreciate that. You bet. Um, I want to remind folks, we are at the top of the hour. This was planned to go an hour. I kind of knew we were going to go a little bit over. So please hang around with us because we're going to do Q&A at the end. And we're also going to give an offer code to get a huge discount on the, the Alchemist library. We're going to do that at the end. But if you miss it, we're recording this. And you know the, the on-demand replay will be available to you afterwards. So I'll be emailing everyone with a link to watch the replay. So if you got to go you got to go. So uh, totally understood. And you'll you'll get a link to the replay if you can't stick around now. Um, but let's continue. Richard is up next. Richard, give us give us your elevator pitch, man. Like what what <laughs> is uh, when you're out hanging out? You're in uh, you're Amsterdam, right? Right now. Yeah. yeah we're yeah. recording this. Um, when you're hanging out on the town in Amsterdam, when you could do that, what <laughs> back in the day, people say, hey, Richard, people say, hey, Richard, what do you do? What, what do you tell them? Um, well, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a people photographer and, and, and I usually say like, yeah, a people photographer in every sense of the way because all the images that I take usually have people in them. Um, I don't really do a lot of weddings, but usually depends on the people. Again, 
I base what I shoot on the people that want me to shoot them. So if I kind of like the people, if they're fun people, if they're cool to work with, then I work with you. If they're people that I don't really like, I don't work with them. So I base that off of, I say, yeah, the people that I like. So I'm a people photographer that shoots nice. people. You're you're a people I like photographer. That's what you are. It's pretty much. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, 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 take it away. Yeah, go ahead and screen yeah. share it and uh, show us what you got. I'm excited to see this. Cool. So, um, just like Kate, um, I mean, we're in quarantine here as well. So I was sitting at home and um, I was asked to make something a little Halloween, a little bit creepy. So I was going to build a set. Um, I'm not really like a compositing artist. I don't, I mean, there are some compositing elements that are used in this shot, but I'm not really somebody that goes from scratch and thinking of an idea and think about it in compositing terms. I usually like to get everything in camera as much as I can and get the lighting as much as I can. And that's not because um, um, uh, um, I, don't, I, I can't do it or I don't want to do it. It's usually because if I put my camera on a tripod, I, I jump around so many times that I bump into it and then it like shifts perspective. So I can rarely keep my camera in one place for longer than five minutes and shoot something. So I got to do it with what I got to do. So this is my final image. Um, what I like about shooting at home is um, I've been doing this for a long time. Ever since I started photography, I started shooting at home. And it's a way to kind of, um, uh, it, it, it challenges you to be creative in a space you see every day. So you're in your house every day, you're, you're in the room every day, you see the kitchen every day, and you're kind of like, you got to push yourself to be creative in a space you see every day and to make it creative and to make it not look like it's your house or, you know, your place. And that's kind of how um, selfies for me started and how photography for me started is like um, putting some lights on myself, putting a new lens on myself, and then trying to make my house not look like my house. So what I did here is um, usually how I work. Um, I, I, I put my camera down, I put it on a tripod, I look through it, I look to the scene, and I kind of roughly get what the scene was gonna look like. So I wanted to have a table scene for this. I, I shoved in the table into my living room. I put up a backdrop, it's a cloth backdrop. And I start, start putting elements on the table. Before I, sh I put elements on the table, just like Kate, I kind of have a rough idea of what I'm gonna do. If you look at the video, you'll see me like sketching ideas and, and going through different kinds of ideas. And as soon as you have like a rough sketch of what you're gonna do, I knew I was gonna do some, I don't know, mad scientist, um, weird things on a table kind of shoot, like old radio type of shoot. So knowing this, I had to find these elements around my house to put in the scene and, and use. So I put my camera down, put the table down, find the elements I want and then fire off a shot and see what I got. And this was just natural light coming off a window from the right. So pretty much just like Kate, I had to like kill all the natural light coming in from, from the window. I just mm -hmm. used uh, some, some foam cords and some V-flats, put them on the window, killed all the lights. Um, I usually don't plan um, my lighting, but that's because um, I get put into different situations and every situation asks for a different lighting scheme. So I usually just build up my scene or figure out my um, 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 composition. And from then on, I'll, I'll decide what I'm gonna do with my lights, where I'm gonna add my lights. So for this, because I have a table, I wanted like a very little light on the table. I wanted like to highlight the elements that were on the table. I used a strip light, a Snaplux Anagram strip light. It has a grid in it. And I the grid I have for the spill. I didn't want the grid to spill the light on my backdrop. It's a very small space. It's my living room. Um, it's a very tight space. And in order to control the light a little bit more directly on the table, I used the grid to like, you know, narrow the spill of the beam onto the table. Um, what I'm showing here is what you see here is I have a, this is my main light. It's the, it's the Allenchrome strip light. Then over here, I have a deep octa. You can't see it in this shot, but if I go to this shot, you see there's a deep octa right here. It's a, that one fills in the scene a little bit more, gives a little bit more light. And then in the back, I have this orange gel light to kind of accentuate, highlight the, 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 the desk lamp I have on top of the old radio. You can see a little better if I fire them one by one off. So this is just me firing off the strip light. I fire off a shot, so I put a light down, fire off a shot, look at the image, and then adjust or figure out what I want changed in the scene. I put it down, I looked, I said, okay, this is way too dark. I need a little bit more frontal, frontal fill light. So that's where I put the deep octa 100 centimeter, filled in a little bit, and that's where you get like a little bit more fill light in the, in the shot. What I was then missing is I was missing a little bit of the ambiance 
this is even before I know what Kate was doing. So when Kate like blew with a yellow, I was like, ah, that was exactly what I wanted with my ambiance on the left. <laughs> so I was missing some of the little ambiance. So I put a gel light on the back to like fill in a little bit of the yellow light as well. That's what you get here. You see it filling in the shots. So because I'm using flash photography, I noticed um, it was killing the, the, the color I had in the jars and it was a kill, killing a little bit of the, 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 the color I had here. So this is where I had decided like I, I'm going to composite that back in. I'm going to shoot it with natural light and just slightly composite back in some color that I'm losing over here instead of adding another flash or something else to just highlight that area. <clears throat> And that's pretty much it. So you put down the lights and as soon as my lights are ready and I'm happy and I'm, and I'm all good, I put up some masks and pull up some faces. Um, I wasn't really happy with this one because the mask was taking up um, too much light. It was, it, looking, it, was looking, it was looking a little bit too dull for me. So this is when I decide like, okay, I need something to catch the eye. I need a highlight in here somewhere. So let's find another mask. So this mask I got actually with Renee, I think a few years ago when I was in Canada and, and Renee went to a Halloween store right around these times, I guess, it was about a year ago around this time. Um, we went to a Halloween store and I got this mask and I brought it home with me. And this one had like the perfect highlight shine that I wanted to have like the little punch in, punch in the image. And if you add like a little Photoshop flair to it, I darken the eyes. I created an iris and you can see all this back in the tutorials, like how to create an iris from scratch. And as you can see, like I said, the, oh, that one jumped. The highlights on the jars as well, because I was losing the lights, I composited it back in slightly and I also composited back in a little bit more of the natural light that was coming from the desk lamp. And this is pretty much kind of in a nutshell how I, 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 I build up my scene, how I, I start off with a table and put down all the elements and look through my camera and then slowly build up the light and um, get the image to, to where I want it to go. That's great. That is great. So when you, when you, when you sort of conceptualize that image, uh, the final image, is it, is, you know, and I've asked Renee this question before too, is it, do you have like a bank of images in your head that, that kind of haunt you and you gotta, <laughs> you, you gotta create them to get rid of them? <laughs> I think I think I think it's it's partly of 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 all the weird shit we've seen uh, in, in our lives and all the movies that we've seen that kind of comes back as soon as you say Halloween we're like yes bring it all in <laughs> I had so many ideas creepy people coming out of the table people keep people tied up on the table and me eating them and yeah it goes all the way but then I gotta like confine it to like the the constraints that we have with the Corona times and how many people yeah. I can have in the house. <laughs> Isn't that crazy though? I mean, I love this stuff because it's it's it it frees like when you look at Photoshop in the compositing art form, it sort of frees your mind to create whatever the heck you want to create, right? Definitely. From whatever dimension, whatever dream you had, whatever idea you had, you can or whatever inspiration you caught from some science fiction movie or whatever, you can create it. You can create <laughs> it in your head and then execute it on paper or on on the computer and then learn along the way. You don't necessarily, what I'm learning from this is you don't necessarily need all the skills to create like a Becca or a Richard or a Kate level production. You have, you need the idea. And like Kate was saying, you create a pro problem solve and figure it out to get to where you want to go. But you got to know where you kind of have an idea of where you want to go. Then you problem solve to get there and iterate along the way, right? Exactly. And then, and even and even if 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 I mean I'm I'm talking about way way in the beginning when I was starting out, I didn't have an uh, exact idea where I was going, but I knew I wanted to learn something, right? So I knew if I bought my new 50 millimeter lens, I wanted to know what is this 50 millimeter lens? What is this depth of field? Mm -hmm. So I I would challenge myself to use that that specific element of that lens or when I bought my first flash to use that one flash um, to use that first softbox and create something interesting not just create a selfie and see what it works and let it go I was like okay that, that's fine but now can we even make the selfie a little bit more interesting can we add some more stuff can we create the story and then slowly the story would build inside my mind so the best part would be waking up with a story and having an idea and working towards that but it's also you can also not have an idea but grab a technique or, or, or a flash or a softbox or something you want to try out and put it there and just try to find elements around you to make it a little bit more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So inspiring. 
Thank you, Richard. I, I appreciate that. That was really, really cool. Uh, okay. And that, now, I, now I'm going to be up all night watching your tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> it will haunt you in your sleep. I wouldn't, I wouldn't stay up all night. <laughs> it's better watching the news. I'm going to watch that instead of the news. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, let's, let's bring it on home with Renee. Renee, you, you brought all these people together in the Alchemist Library. You have a course in the Alchemist Library as well. Take it away. What, what, what do you want to add to this conversation? Okay, um, so I'm not muted. Good. Okay, um, so in this case, I didn't pick an image uh, from my tutorial because I was like, there's this, this other technique that I would like to show you guys that I never get to talk about. And that's the whole point of the Alchemist Library is that we get to share stuff that we never get to talk about. So I'm going to do that for you here. Uh, share. Cool. Okay, so this is, um, it's Richard. <laughs> <laughs> <That's Richard. laughs> yeah. Inception. So, yeah, this is uh, it was when he, the when he, yeah. This is when he came to Canada um, because the PPOC brought him over to to speak, and I was like, "Sweet, uh, we're gonna hang out and do stuff." And so, because we're always, I'm in Europe all the time, taking up space in his house, and so he got to take up space in Canada. And I was like, "We need to shoot in my studio," so that's what we did. Um, so this is. This is the shot, the base shot. So it's pretty simple lighting. It's not super complicated. There's a big PLM uh, over the top of his head and a beauty dish here and just like a little big, well, little big. <laughs> There's another fill light just out of frame. It's a gigantic source of light because I wanted kind of dramatic shadows from just the, there's the PLM over top of his head. Um, but then I didn't want to just have like this dark eyes and stuff because I knew that I was probably going to Photoshop something into his eye, but I didn't know what yet. Um, and then, you know, this light here just adds a little bit of a fill light again, because the black in the robe is, it just sucks in so much light. It's really easy for it to just turn into a blob of black. So I had to throw a lot of light at it to keep the texture of the material itself. And Renee, um, before you continue, what is a PLM for folks that don't oh, know? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, that's a, it's an alien B light modifier. It's a seven foot umbrella. Um, and it's big and it's soft and it's easy to fold up and down. Um, I have lots of friends who love like octoboxes boxes and stuff and I just hate putting them together. I got dislocated my shoulder two years ago and I don't have the grip strength anymore to, to like put them together. So I was just like, umbrellas are life now, <laughs> yep. you know, or like I have this gigantic octa box that I just like stuff into the back of my truck and I'm like, well, that, that's my whole volume of my vehicle. So. <laughs> <laughs> you buy cars to fit your light modifiers, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. I bought like a big ass vehicle just to fit my gear. Um, so yeah, but it doesn't fit, but it's seven feet. So it's like a big soft light source, but depending where you stand someone, it really can change, um, you know, how dramatic the lighting is on their face. Uh, but yeah, so I'm not going to walk you through the composite bits because that takes forever. Um, but I wanted to show you this super cool technique that I use for adding fire. Cause I was like, I was like, man, Richard, like, what are we going to put you in? I was like, you look kind of badass and like with the sword and the stuff and like, you know, and then uh, I think I messaged him like six months later and I was like, hey, Richard, how do you feel about church burning? Is that like you? you... <laughs> Let's do it. Okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's burn it. <laughs> Let's burn it down. Let's do it. <laughs> I was like, because I got this, these ruins that I shot at an old church and they're like, you know, in the Second World War, they stripped all the, the metal off the roof so that they could use it for ammunition and whatever else. And I was like, you just laid it on fire. <laughs> so, um, he said he was down. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so how I like to do fire, um, in this case, what I wanted to do was uh, paint in all of the texture here around the bottom of it because I wanted it to feel like, you know, he was like breaking the earth, you know, and like bringing up, you know, hell through the rocks, right? And it was, it's, it's a deconsecrated ground, essentially. And I was like, sounds like fun. So, <laughs> Um, what I did instead of, um, let's see, let's disable their mask. Um, so I put the blending mode onto linear dodge, but it's actually a photograph of, of coals that I took. So I just, there, I had a fire, um, in a fireplace and I just like photographed a bunch of coals and then I put the blending mode onto linear dodge. And, um, I'm like Becca, I kind of have like this, like, you know, 
girl hard on for for brushes i have billions of brushes and so i was like scrolling and like which one's gonna work for this and um so my mask looks like this so i'm just using like a whole bunch of different textured brushes and i just started like painting in all these areas where i thought you know these like fractures could happen um, and the reason why I'm using a textured uh, image behind is because if I just painted red, it's very it has it's very one dimensional, right? So I want to use something that had that feels like it's alive because it is alive. Mm -hmm. um, and then like using the textured brush uh, really kind of you know helps make all that seem a little bit more realistic. And I didn't necessarily also um, like I didn't necessarily want all of these spots to be super 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 bright colors right I wanted it to feel like there was really something underneath there so yeah painting with a single color doesn't really like do it for me when I'm creating these kinds of environments um then of course like curves adjustments you know like now we're painting in the glow right so because of course fire is a light source so we have to start painting in the glow of where is the fall off from all of this fire going to be mm -hmm. um and then this is a hue saturation adjustment for something really small. I think it's something on his face. It's one of these things in all of my PSD layers. I'm like, I have a layer where I'm like, I don't know, it probably does something. <laughs> like 3 a.m. me when I'm working on this. I'm like, oh yeah, I noticed this like little tiny dot. And then I just forget. <laughs> and I'm going through it later, walking through it. And I'm like, oh, it's probably, I've made the mistake of deleting those layers before. And then like you go to print the file and you're like, that's what the layer was for. So I don't delete anything anymore. <laughs> um but then from here um i'm basically like i have a whole bunch of like fire textures um that i've made and that i've like created over the years and i just started like stacking these things on the screen blending mode and normally on screen blending mode um it doesn't work super super well on a light background but because what i'm putting this onto is such a dark exposure um, just putting it on screen blend would works nicely. Um, if I was putting this on a lighter background, um, as you'll see in one of the tutorial, the tutorial I did, um, I have to use the blend if, which is what Becca was talking about. And I'm a recent convert to blend if for years. I hated it. I was like, blend if is garbage. <laughs> um, but, uh, when it comes to creating realistic fire, blend if is definitely part of the process. Um, so here I'm just like, Again, using these fire textures that I've made and I'm just masking them in. So again, it feels like they're coming out of the ground. Um, and then just like, again, stacking them, stacking them. I'm also trying to be aware of the size of the fire because you can have really great fire textures, but it can be the wrong size. So I wanna make sure that everything that I'm creating uh, is the right scale. So I can't use for fire that's super far away. I need to have fire that is the correct scale to fire that's closer and larger or smaller, etc. So I have this like gigantic library of, of shit that I've made over the years. Um, and, you know, just like scrolling through it. So that's like part of the three hours is like, which fire piece is going to be the right one? Um, so yeah, so just like stacking these in, figuring out where they're all going to go. And I think this part goes over his face. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, because I, I bleached out one of his eyes. Um, and then I was like, yeah, let's have like a little bit of it because it's, it's like coming from within him, right? He's channeling this stuff. Um, and then sparks, because if you have fire coming up, you got to have sparks. I love sparks. I add sparks into like absolutely everything. So <laughs> even where it you, shouldn't be, I'm like, those sparks. Do you draw those sparks in by hand or are those, a, those, a, a spark brush that you created over, over the years? Um, so all of the above. So in this case here, this is, um, it's from one of my stock packs that I made the, the sparks packs. It's just, um, I made it with a combination of realistic fire and then like illustrated fire and just like smashed them together. And I was like that pattern. I like, so yeah and that's like basically how i like to take you know that kind of environment and then making sure that it looks realistic and so the rest of it then just becomes color grading i'm not as advanced as kate when it comes to color uh theory i'm like warm and cool yeah <laughs> warm stuff forward cool stuff back we're good <laughs> i'm very simple that way but i like it and i do it in like so much of my work and it's it's fine by me so um yeah, and I've been using like Adobe Camera Raw for color grading for a while now, which has been really fun. But 
you know, again, just like really paying attention to what this ambient fire is going to look like and then how to smash it all together. And then eventually a few hours later, you come out the other side and you're like, oh my God, it's tomorrow. <laughs> so... <laughs> I love the life philosophy of warm stuff forward, cool stuff back. I think that needs to be a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, I mean, it, like, it is, you know, even if you photograph in, in landscapes, right, if you, you know, things that are further away um, are cooler and they have less detail and less saturation, right? So I kind of try to keep that in mind when I'm creating these composites. Because as I've discovered, if you're going to, fake it it has to match reality as much as possible but if you're shooting it on location you have to remove it as much as possible so like if you're painting if you're photorealistic painting a face you want like really great technique is painting the wrinkles painting the the different color temperatures that happen on a face that doesn't have makeup on it right the pinks and the blues and the purples kind of under the eye really great oil paint oil painters paint all that stuff whereas really great beauty retouchers know how to remove all that stuff Right. So there's like, if you're going to fake it, you have to make it look like reality. And if you're going to shoot reality, you have to make it look fake. <laughs> it's this weird thing that we've made. So, but yeah, that's like, that's my elevator pitch. That's kind of, that's kind of how I like doing it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Mind blown on all this stuff. So, you know, the, this, this, whole, this whole webinar that went a little bit longer and we knew it would, but yeah, this, right. I think this whole webinar right. was designed to give folks kind of a teaser into what's possible. Right. Yeah. And, and just sort of whet the appetite, even if you're not a compositing artist, if you, you know, retouch and you shoot your images and you kind of get things perfect and you share these techniques work with everything, right? If you, it's just, there's a lot of power there. So one of, one of the questions I want to throw out there before we, we wrap this up is from Thomas Aaron. Um, and he posed the question, assuming one is decent with the basics of Photoshop, what would be the top three Photoshop skills one, one should start to start with to embark on a compositing journey? Like where, where should you start with this stuff? If you're, you're a good photographer, I know Thomas Aaron is a good photographer. Yeah. Kate, you go ahead and take this. If he wants, if he wants to up his number, skills, where, where should he start? Number one is learn how to make good masks and it's mm. the worst part but is the most important part. Absolutely. Masking. Okay. Yeah. And masking with paths or pixels, which is the best way. It's so situational. Um, I find myself masking in a variety of different ways and it really just depends on the texture and it depends on depth of field. Um, and there's definitely a lot of nuance to that. Um, and the, the quicker you can kind of get that under, under your belt, the more, uh, the more proficient you'll become at composite work. Love it. Love it. Okay. So that's one. So what are the other two? He asked for three. Anybody else have a second one? Somebody that wants to be a world-class compositing artist. Yes. Masking. Then what? What after that? I mean, I, um, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was going to say lighting, and I know that's not necessarily a Photoshop skill, um, but mm -hmm. absolutely having a good understanding of how light physically functions is going to take your composites from this was made in Photoshop to, is that real? You know? Um, so before anything Why else, <laughs> like, that too. absolutely <laughs> understanding how the physical world works. Like Renee was talking about atmospheric perspective and the way that color is influenced by atmosphere and distance. Those are the kind of things that are really going to make a huge impact on your composites yeah. beyond anything yeah. else. Um, and I think beyond that, you know, understanding color is mm. like number three. So you're going to have to understand how to match your perspectives and everything else. But I mean, I see so many really great composites or great idea composites, but their color temperatures are all over the place, you know, where their color harmony makes absolutely zero sense. Um, yeah, and all three of those things are really, really hard to learn. They take a lot of time, but th it's totally learnable. I do think that most people who get into photography who want to learn compositing, I think like 95% of people compositing on some level is totally achievable. It's completely achievable. There's like this weird myth around compositing that has to be super hard. And sometimes it is super hard, but you know, you can, you can do, um, you know, Photoshop and like make a bottle float, you know, if you're really wanting to like, you know, how do we, how do we make a cup, like look like it was floating and like pouring tea out of it, but there's no hand there, right? If you want to get started in this stuff, 
make it easy and it's it's 100 percent attainable Love which it. is what we were hoping to do with the alchemist library you know that's like is is that we have so many different skill levels and so many different techniques like i'm tired of people saying like there's only one way to do it and i'm like no there isn't here's a whole bunch of artists who have a whole bunch of different styles and then like take in what makes sense to you and then apply it to your own love it love it well that's that's a good that's a good note to close on so the alchemist library at alchemistslibrary.com and it's an iq test if you can spell alchemists right so, <laughs> so if you can't spell it you can't get this so alchemistslibrary.com is where all this stuff is all these guys and how many artists are in there total we have 15 for the spooky season yeah we like locked and loaded it with like a ton of artists from all over the world and we were just like yeah let's do some cool shit <laughs> fantastic okay so alchemistslibrary.com and for the this week in photo audience you you set up a coupon code twip pro 15 um to knock is it 15 percent off or 15 bucks off uh 15 percent 15 percent off the price and what's the retail price right now uh 149 yeah and okay. we're cool. it goes offline on november 7th so so it vanishes on november 7th in yep, season over two we're days? working on winter. <laughs> We were supposed to do this a few days ago, but the, we were, but the world. yeah, Frederick got in the way. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Okay. So we'll have to promote this hard to make sure everybody knows about it. So 149 <laughs> Twip Pro 15 to get 15% uh, off of that, but the whole deal goes away. Is it like gone forever after yep. the seventh? So midnight yep. on the seventh is it like, be specific. Cause we're getting down to the wire like here. <laughs> we're, come on we're counting votes here renee <laughs> i know that's why i'm not that's why i'm making it loose <laughs> might wake up on the eighth in the morning and go off i mean i'm in newfoundland right now so i'm like a few i'm a bunch of hours ahead of you guys so i'm not gonna stay up till five in the morning to turn it off at midnight pacific i'll probably just wake up in the morning <laughs> okay. 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 Awesome. well cool well thank, thank all of you uh becca kate renee richard for for coming on here and doing this you you all did a fantastic job this is a great presentation uh i'm excited to dive into photoshop deeper now and i i feel i'm bittersweet because i feel like i've learned a lot but i've also learned that i don't know a lot and i need a lot <laughs> i have a lot to go so this is, this is fantastic um, so we'll we'll wrap it up right there. Uh, before we do, before we click the end button, I want to go around one more time and give you guys a chance to give final remarks or like throw anything out there that you'd like. Uh, Richard, let's start with you. You went last, so you can go first. Any any <laughs> final remarks? Uh, the, the final remarks. You can you put me on the spot right here. <laughs> yes, that's what I do. <laughs> uh, you stay anything. inside. Stay <laughs> safe. <laughs> It's Halloween. <laughs> Crazy out there. <laughs> All right. And Kate, Works what about for Halloween you? and COVID. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kate, any final remarks? Um Yeah, I, I think I think photography for me is about story. It's about creativity. It's about making cool shit. Um, and don't let budget be an obstacle for you. Um and I think hopefully everyone's shown today kind of tools and tricks that you can do in Photoshop to make um, your wildest photographic fantasies come true. So don't let anything hold you back. That's right. Yeah. Because Richard's burning, burning churches and eating people over there. So. <laughs> <laughs> No, this is going to go online. Like, okay. <laughs> I'm going to get a call from my mom going like, what did I hear? It's happening. <laughs> exactly. You will be held accountable, Richard. <laughs> All right. And Becca, last but not least, what, any, any f parting thoughts for us? I mean, Kate kind of beat me to it there. Like, defy, defy your limits. I mean, you can create basically anything in your freaking living room. Um, I mean, like I did that vampire photo for the tutorial as a self portrait that my kids helped me with in the living room. Like you are not limited by makeup or hair or location or anything. Like you can literally do anything if you have a computer and a will to learn how. So go do something. I love That's it. it. Go do something. Sky's the limit. Action. Take Let's action. Let's do it. And the final, final word from, from the creator of the Alchemist Library, Renee Robin, <laughs> take us home. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I can't really like say anything new on that. Like, don't get COVID, be creative, <laughs> don't be limited. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, be, be very aware of your creative box that you get in where you build these rules of like how it has to be and how it needs to be. You know, that's my favorite thing about creating this library was like when I was going through the videos, I was like, oh my God, all these artists have completely different techniques and it's all like in one little space. And I just love, I love the brains that are involved in this and it just makes me really happy. <laughs> that, is that is good. You should be proud. You should be proud of what you built. That's awesome. I and just can't believe they all said yes. <laughs> there you go. First rule of dating right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> so one, one it's only question. only stalking if they say no. <laughs> one, one comment that came in, uh, Thomas Aaron in the chat was saying that was a self portrait, Becca. So. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean, like, like I didn't I, know that was a self portrait. That was a self portrait. No, <laughs> I, I literally didn't know. And I was sitting there staring at the great screen for an hour today. I, I didn't put it together. <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, like my, my son, I had my son help me. It was like two 30 in the morning or something totally ridiculous. Like my daughter who you, I think you guys can see down here in my lap yeah. was like running yeah. around we and she's like, the hair. The light stands. <laughs> so yeah, group effort. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. Well, we'll wrap it here. Uh, we went a little bit long, but thanks everybody for hanging in there. If you guys want to rewatch this, of course, the replay will be available uh, hopefully at some point tomorrow. So you can check it out. Um, if you haven't grabbed the Alchemist Library, go ahead and grab it now because evil Renee is going to take it away in two days <laughs> from now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so get it while the getting's good. All right. Well, folks, well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for doing this. And uh, we'll see you hopefully again for the next Alchemist Library, if that pops up.